Chapter 14 Brinjal I bent over a smoky fire fueled by cow dung, cooking brinjal curry under the watchful eye of my mother-in-law. The kitchen was tiny and airless. My back ached. The smoke made my throat burn. Sweat poured into my eyes. I wiped it off furiously. I wasn't going to give my mother-in-law the satisfaction of thinking that she had reduced me to tears, though in fact I was on the verge of weeping with frustration. She sat pristine in her white widow's sari, her hair blacker and glossier than it had any right to be. She was old, after all, with five grown sons. Flicking stones from the cheap red rice that her sons had begged as arms. The heat didn't seem to affect her. At first, I thought it was because she had positioned herself in front of the single small window. But perhaps she had inner resources beyond what my eyes could see. A subtle disdain flickered under the composure that marked her face. It seemed to say, You find this difficult? Why then? You'd never have survived a hundredth part of what I've been through. I'd entered a household full of mysteries, secrets that no one articulated. I'd have to use all my resources to try and decipher them. But one thing I already knew. From the moment she saw me yesterday, my mother-in-law regarded me as her adversary. It had turned evening by the time Arjun and I entered a small settlement at the edge of the town, with dilapidated mud walls pressed up against each other. I thought I'd prepared myself to accept hardship, but... My heart fell as I noted the alleys stinking with refuse, the stray dogs with their open sores. It was all I could do to not clap a hand over my nose. As we turned a corner, four young men, all dressed like Arjun, as poor Brahmins, joined us. I knew these must be the other Pandavas. From under my veil, I darted glances at their faces, but I couldn't recognize a single one. What art of disguise had they learned? The brothers embraced Arjun and cuffed him on the shoulder, chiding him for not allowing them to help him in the fight. When they turned to greet me, their eyes were alight with curiosity and, I thought, admiration. Not sure how a new wife should behave with her brother-in-law, I bowed my head and joined decorous palms, though I was equally curious. They were a lively lot the two youngest ones, miming how the defeated kings had run from my husband, the large, muscled one slapping his knees and doubling over with laughter, while the el eldest watched indulgently. My husband was pleased by their praise, though he didn't say much. At their approach, he'd let go of my arm, a fact I didn't care for. The oldest brother, this would be Yudhishthir, urged us to hurry. We are late, he said. You know how mother worries. 
We turned the final corner and there was their hut, the meanest in the row. From the small kitchen window came the clink of pots, the tallest of them, if I remembered right, his name was Beam, winked at Arjun. Mother's always so serious. Let's play a trick on her. Before the others could stop him, he called out, Ma, come and see what we have brought home today. Son, said a woman's voice in a patrician accent. I can't come right now or the food will burn. But as always, whatever you brought should be shared equally amongst all my sons. The brothers looked at each other, embarrassed. Yudhishthir frowned at Bhim. You certainly have a way of getting into trouble and dragging us along. Let me go and explain. He disappeared through the low doorway. I thought he would be back soon, but he didn't return for a long time. The brothers waited in awkward silence. I sensed that they hesitated to invite me in without their mother's permission. I looked toward Arjun, but, perhaps deliberately, he was watching a plume of smoke rising from a nearby hut. I stood on the porch, feeling parched and unwelcome, the regrets I'd chased away returning to descend on me like vultures. When my legs hurt too much, I sat down on the ground, leaned my back against the wall and closed my eyes. I must have dozed. When I opened them again, my mother-in-law loomed above me like a statue carved from ice. And, though I had doubts about the identity of her sons, I knew at once that I was staring up at the widowed queen, Kunti. Kunti didn't believe in using spices, or perhaps she just didn't believe in letting her daughter-in-law have any. She had handed me a pulpy brinjal along with a lump of salt and a minute amount of oil and told me to prepare it for lunch. I asked her if I might have a bit of turmeric and some chilies, perhaps some cumin. She replied, This is all there is. This isn't your father's palace. I didn't trust her words. In the alcove behind her I could see bowls and jars, a pouch, on the floor sat a grinding stone stained yellow from its last use. I swallowed my anger and chopped the brinjal on the dull cutting blade. I rubbed salt into it and dropped it into the pan. There was too little oil. The cow dung fire burned too high. And I didn't know how to reduce it. In a few minutes, the pieces began to get scorched. I was about to give up and let them burn to blackness, when turning, I saw the smallest of smiles on Kunti's face. I understood. If the fish had been Arjun's test, this was mine. This is what Kunti declared to her sons yesterday, before she said a single word to me. All through my life, even in the hardest of times, everything I said, I made sure it was done. 
I told myself I'd bring you up as princess in the halls of your forefathers, and no matter how much harassment I faced, I held on to my promise. Sons, if you value what I did for you, you must now honor my word. All five of you must marry this woman. I stared at her, my brain trying to take in what she had said. Was she joking when she said, they must all marry me? No, her face made that clear. I wanted to shout, five husbands, are you mad? I wanted to say, I'm already married to Arjun. But Vyasa's prophecy recoiled upon me, robbing me of my protests. I recognized, too, the thinly veiled insult in Kunti's words. This woman, as though I were a nameless servant, it angered me, but it also hurt. From the stories I had heard about Kunti, I would admired her. I would imagined that if she did indeed become my mother-in-law, she would love me as a daughter. Now I saw how naive I had been. A woman like her would never tolerate anyone who might lure her sons away. The brothers looked at me with speculation in their eyes. They didn't protest. Maybe they weren't used to contradicting their mother. Or maybe the idea wasn't as repugnant to them as it was to me. Only Arjun blurted out, Mother, how can you ask us to do this? It's contrary to dharma. Let us eat now, Kunti said. Underneath the serenity, her voice was like steel. Here was a woman's power at work. In spite of my fury, I felt a grudging admiration. It's late. You're tired. We can discuss it tomorrow. Arjun drew in his breath. I waited for him to stand up for me, to tell his mother that he and I were already husband and wife, committed to each other. She had no right to destroy that. To my disappointment, he said nothing. Now that she had had her way, Kunti turned to me. She allowed herself to smile as she welcomed me with a bouquet of gracious words. But I felt the thorns underneath. When it was time for bed, the brothers unrolled their mats and lay down, one beside the other. Kunti placed her mat at their heads and gave me the last rat-nibbled one to lie on. I was to sleep near the brother's feet at a chaste distance. I considered refusing, but I was too wary. I'd save my rebellion for another day. I drifted in and out of sleep all night, listening to the plaintive calls of owls watching the moon drag itself across the small window. I was uncomfortable, miserable, disillusioned, and most of all, angry with Arjun. I had expected him to be my champion. It was the least he could have done after plucking me from my home. When inside me a voice whispered, 
Karna would never have let you down like this. I did not hush it. The night seemed endless. Someone snored. Someone else shouted angrily in his dream. Once I thought I saw a man looking in through the window. To my blurred, homesick eyes, his face looked like threes, though that was impossible. And a good thing, too. Three would have been enraged to see me like this, lying on the floor at the feet of these men, on my wedding night, no less, when my bed should have been piled with scented silks. When I should have been held close and cherished. But I was no longer my brother's to protect or indulge, I thought. Tears of self-pity filling my eyes. I'd placed a garland around the neck of a man who hadn't even cared to tell me his name, and it had changed everything. I was about to give in to despair when a thought came to me. This is what she is hoping for. The heat of that realization dried up my tears. I took a resolute breath, the way Kunti might have if she were in my place. I loosened my muscles using the techniques the sorceress had taught. I no longer resisted the floor, but let my body sink into it. One moment at a time, I told myself. What use was it to worry about the future, which might take a shape far different from what either Kunti or I wanted? And with that, sleep came to me. You're burning the brinjal, Kunti said, her voice kind. Also, you've put in too much salt. Oh, look how red your eyes are. I should have guessed that a princess like you, brought up in luxury, wouldn't have any experience with cooking. She gave a patient sigh. Never mind. You can scrub the pots while I repair the curry. But I was ready now. Respected mother, I said, bowing. Being so much younger, I know my culinary skills can't equal yours, but it's my duty to relieve you of your burdens whenever possible. Please let me do so. If your sons are displeased with the food, I'll gladly accept the blame. I turned to the pot and covered it with a battered dish and focused on what the sorceress had taught me. I willed the oil to bubble up, the brinjal to soften. I prayed to the fire to hold back its power. I closed my eyes and imagined a rich paste of poppy seed and cinnamon coating the pieces. I didn't open them until the aroma filled my nostrils. When at mealtime the brothers praised the brinjal for its distinctive taste and asked for more, I remained in the kitchen and let Kunti serve her sons. I kept my face carefully impassive, my eyes on the floor, but she and I both knew that I'd won the first round. <laughs>